Welcome back to The Heat. In a week when U.S. President Donald Trump was praised for his address to a joint session of the United States Congress, he is again on the defensive as he deals with more controversy. His Attorney General Jeff Sessions is under fire for failing to disclose to Congress that he had meetings with Russia's ambassador to the U.S. during the presidential campaign. Sessions says he did nothing wrong and Trump is sticking with him. Joining me now here in the studio is Julianne Malveaux. She is an economist, writer and political commentator. Also joining us from California is Lani Chen. He is a fellow with the Hoover Institution and he was director of policy for the Mitt Romney presidential campaign in 2012. Also with us in the studio is Anton Fedyashin. He is a professor of Russian history at American University. Welcome to all of you to the studio. Oh, thank you. Julian, let me start with you. The week started off relatively well for President Trump, relatively. Uh, but from there, it seems to have gone downhill. So he had this address to Congress, joint sitting of Congress. Then this controversy breaks out over Jeff Sessions. What's happening here? What's wrong? Everything is wrong. I mean, the address, actually, he did get kudos for it. He clearly was either medicated or calm. Um, he, he delivered in a way that we haven't often seen. We've occasionally <laughs> seen him, you know, kind of keep it in. He didn't mention the election too many times. Usually when he's speaking, he has to remind us that he won by so many votes or so many electoral votes. Um, so while the address was well delivered, if you delved into it, there was not a lot of substance there. He talked about tax cuts, but we didn't get any specifics. He talked about fixing Obamacare, but we didn't get any specifics. Uh, early in the week, uh, which just a point of personal privilege, he brought in uh, 80 historically black college presidents and said he was gonna do this great executive order, which he didn't do. He did nothing that anyone else hasn't done. So basically these people were basically played for a photo op. Uh, there was a photo op, but not a whole lot of interaction. The Sessions thing was buzzing around. It's been buzzing around. Uh, the relationship between Trump and Russia is one that we can't seem to get to the bottom of. If he would release his tax returns, if we could get some transparency about the relationships he's had, we might be able to deal with something. Now the uh, revelation that his son-in-law, Jerry Kushner, has also met with the Russians is extremely troubling. But all of this is troubling. Sessions, under pressure, has said he will recuse himself from any investigation of the campaign. That's a good thing. But what he really needs to do, since he perjured himself, is essentially to step down. He isn't going to do it. But when the top lawyer is also a liar, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do? Just to be certain about something, meeting with Russians is not necessarily a treasonous offense, is it? Not at all. No, I mean, we live in a global and very fluid right. society. I don't even have a problem with mm. Mr. Trump saying that he'd like to have a less contentious relationship. You're right. With right. I mean, yeah. I, I, don't, I wish we didn't have any contention anywhere in the world. Okay. But, 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 mm. but lying is um, perjury. And that is a criminal offense. And if you're the attorney general and you're lying, it, it's, it's a deal breaker. Okay, let me go to Lonnie Chen in California. Uh, Lonnie, it looks like this administration is having a serious communications problem. It seems like senior officials are saying one thing and then they're either contradicted or President Trump is saying something completely different uh, in a very short space of time. Do they have a serious communications problem? Yeah, are they on the same page? And how big an issue is this? I don't think it's a communications problem. I mean, clearly there are differences in emphasis if you look at things, uh, for example, that Secretary Mattis has said and how those might differ from, for example, what the president has said with respect to our relationship with NATO as an example. But I don't think they're completely different. I think at the end of the day, the president is the boss. And I think mm -hmm. that uh, has to be the dominant line coming out of the administration. It is not unusual to have cabinet secretaries who have views that are somewhat disparate from those of the president. I think we're seeing that aired out a little bit more in this administration than in others. I don't think that's the serious problem. I think the question going forward is whether, in fact, the administration is going to maintain its line with respect to our European allies, with respect to our allies in East Asia and in North Asia. I think those have been sources of contention, in part because of President Trump's rhetoric on the campaign trail. So we'll have to see where it goes. But the notion that there are differences, some more or less subtle than others, between what cabinet secretaries say and what the president says is not unusual. Anton, let's get back to Russia. 
uh, we had the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov. He called these accusations against Russia, accusations that Russia was involved in the presidential election, a witch hunt. How is Russia viewing this? Uh, remarkably calmly, actually. I've been following the reactions over the past 48 hours. Uh, the Russians uh, have taken a wait-and-see approach, uh, something that they've been doing for um, what, five weeks. We're now into the uh, into the um, administration, and they're uh, they're they're perfectly willing to to let the internal politics in Washington D.C. play out. And uh, they're waiting to see what will happen, which is very unusual because usually in uh, in uh, diplomatic um, uh, relations there's a tit for tat approach. Um, that's sort of uh, uh, expected. Um, and here uh, the Russians are waiting, which is uh, highly unusual. On the U.S. side, I think uh, what's really important and remarkable uh, that I'm finding with the Trump administration is that foreign policy is becoming highly concentrated in the White House. We know that the State Department has seized its daily briefing, which it did regularly under Obama. So Admiral Kirby met with the press. Uh, Rex Tillerson is conspicuous by his absence, especially when you compare him with how much Kerry and Hillary were in front of the cameras. And so this, uh, in, in many ways, uh, reminds me, as a scholar of uh, the Cold War, the 20th century U.S.-Soviet uh, relations, of the Nixon-Kissinger uh, White House, except there's no Kissinger in the, in the White House mm -hmm. today. But there is a concentration of foreign policy in the White House. There is an absence of transparency. Uh, Nixon considered himself a visionary, and he certainly did achieve breakthroughs, especially with China and the Soviet. Union in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, Trump seems to think of himself the same way. But the payoff is that foreign policy decisions reflect directly uh, on the White House. There's no State Department buffer right. anymore the, where the, the way there was under Obama. Very interesting. Okay. And you know, President Trump has said that he will cut the State Department by 37 percent. I mean, he's put out the numbers that he <clears throat> wants to cut in the State Department. 37%. Well, you can't run the international relations of our country out of the White House. There just isn't the capability there. So to cut the State Department by 37% really hmm. speaks to the point that you've made about the concentration. Definitely. And I think it's really quite frightening, when mm -hmm. that, not only because you've got Russia, big issue, China, big issue, because, again, they've gone at China in ways that are very non-diplomatic at a time when the Chinese economy is not doing especially well. And so that increases the pressure. But then we're not talking about Latin America. We're not talking about the African continent. And these are also areas of concern. Of course, we've talked about Ukraine right. and yeah. Syria. But we've got all these other issues that the United States has often been a buffer in that we may not be if you cut the State Department by 37 oh, percent. Right. There are, there's also talk of cutting foreign aid, and <coughs> that will be looked at in a place like uh, in the continent of Africa as well. Uh, Julian, let me ask you about this. There are two views of what is going on here, especially with this Russian controversy. The one is that we have a president here who is incompetent, who is extremist, who is out of his depth. Uh, there is another view, and this view uh, was articulated by none other than Rush Limbaugh, who is a very influential right wing talk show host here in the United States, and he said, this story is about Barack Obama and the Democrat Party attempting to sabotage the Trump presidency and do everything they can to render it meaningless and ineffective or to get him impeached or force him to resign. Barack Obama ceased to be the president of the United States on January 19, 2017. He has been blamed for everything from they say that he left the economy in a mess, which is not the truth. The unemployment rate is 4.8 percent. Growth is at 2 percent. Um, you know, it hasn't trickled down the way I'd like it to trickle down, but certainly President Obama averted a depression yeah. by managing the Great Recession. Um, President Obama okay. is not the person who's calling people right. to go and do these rallies and all of that. I, I mean, yeah. he's living his life like it's golden. He's getting sixty million dollars. He and Michelle Chris for their book. Yeah. <laughs> they're 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 flying around and sky sky <laughs> okay. kiting or kite sky. You know, th this again, Donald Trump and his people are masters of deflection. Right. They me, want to, this dystopian let view. To, let me go to Lonnie Chen for his view on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lonnie Chen, we've heard this view that this is being manipulated, that we're seeing some manipulation behind the scenes here. Yeah, look, it, it is the case that you have this setup where you have many career bureaucrats 
uh, at agencies like state and defense, and even at the Office of Management and Budget, for that matter, that are not keen on the Trump agenda. I don't think that's any secret. The notion that this is entirely a partisan witch hunt, I think, is wrong. But the notion that there is no partisanship at all in this is also similarly wrong. I think you do have a setup where many in the career bureaucracy don't like President Trump particularly much. They don't particularly like his agenda. That's their prerogative. Well, Lonnie, but it don't is you also think some of them are Republicans, too? You've got a bunch too? of these people that are out there who are perpetrating the leaks against the president. So it is, it is not an entirely partisan issue, but it is the case that there is a conflict between the career bureaucracy and the elected leadership as well as the political leadership that President and Trump is putting in place. But Lonnie, the, the career okay. bureaucracy is both Democratic and Republican. If you look at the career bureaucracy oh, when they were hired, the, come on now, oh, the, 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 you the come vast on. majority of it, it the, no, the vast not at all. Of it if you look liberal. at when people were hired, people were hired under Mr. Bush. People were hired, hired under Big it has Bush. To do with these when they people, were hired. Okay, one some minute. of these people are Republican. Okay, I want to get Antonio. It has to listen. The, I, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the divide in Washington um, does not only run along the Democratic-Republican uh, fault line. Uh, we know that there are uh, very prominent Republicans who have been highly critical of Trump. There's, there are several layers of divisions, and one of them, by the way, when it comes to foreign policy, is a division between um, interventionists or internationalists. The, what you call these guys depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, and between isolationists and nationalists. And the those uh, fissures cut across the party divide line. So there are many levels of fracturing. Um, and this is all a manifestation of uh, what uh, um, I see as a, a general global change in geopolitics and the United States very painfully adopting to its new role in a global system where uh, developing world actors are now claiming a greater say in what happens on, on their borders, what happens around their borders, within spheres of influence. Um, and it's not just the US that's going through these growing pains of readjustment to a completely new uh, world. Right, the world is changing. Um, can we put this down in some way, Julian, to the fact that this is a new administration, they're still trying to find their feet, that it might, they might get to a point where things will settle down, where we will see some something consistent coming out of them. Well, we'd certainly like to see something yeah. consistent and something positive and proactive, but it is very challenging because I think uh, that the people inside the White House are managing um, a personality that does not seem to be um, interested in conformity. Throughout the campaign, we heard that uh, Mr. Trump would become presidential after the nomination. Then throughout the, from the nomination to the election, we got more of the, we got the grab them by the, and all this yeah. and that and the other. And we again heard that, but as soon as he was elected, he would be presidential. But somehow it has not seeped into his brain that he won okay. the election. Yeah. And I think when he accepts the fact that he's won the election, he can be presidential. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us.